Are central banks primarily to blame for the current state of our economy? Or is their role overstated and their influence becoming less and less over time? Today, we dive into the declining influence and control of central banks and ask if we're nearing the end of their reign over the price of money. With debt levels and economic conditions where they are today, it's clear that there are only two paths out of this. Either we have continued wealth distribution from the government to the rich, or we have a monetary revolution. What's it going to be? Welcome to Bitcoin Daily. I'm Dante Cook, head of Swan Business. On a day like today, where there's literally no news out there at the Bitcoin space, one thing that Bitcoiners do is they educate themselves. The level of your conviction rises to the level of your education. Because part of how the Bitcoin rabbit hole changes you is you begin to be curious about things that you thought you knew before that you really didn't know. Which is why Bitcoiners are more educated on the macro economy than Wall Street professionals today. I've met more Bitcoiners that know more about macroeconomics than people that, than, than <laughs> traders that do this for their lives. Because Bitcoiners, I think, have a motivation that is very different, right? They want to learn for the, the right reasons. And they're like, okay, I, I need to understand this system because I really need to understand if what I'm doing is right, right? And what, why? We always question, like, I, up until today, I question, like, Am I crazy, right? Am I, am I the crazy one? Because everybody else is still there. And imagine, like, for my generation, for a long time, you know, this is why I created the Alpha Zeta profile on, on Twitter, because for a long time, I couldn't talk to anybody, you know, around me about Bitcoin, because the few times that I tried, people would just look at me like, literally, I, I was crazy, right? And I remember telling people back in the day, saying, listen, this asset is going to become really important. It's going to be the subject of presidential debates. And people would look at me like, what are you smoking? <laughs> and here we are, right? One of the things that I like to do on days like today is zoom out and continue to try to learn how the larger monetary system works. One of my go-tos for trying to understand the mechanics of the Fed and how the government money printing system works is Joseph Wang, a.k.a. Fed guy. In a recent post, he highlighted that the CBO is projecting the majority of government deficits to come from interest expense, which led me to ask some questions that I've been hearing from Lynn Alden recently, where she's been talking a lot about fiscal dominance. My go-to to learn about how the Fed, central banking, money printing, as well as monetary technology and how it's evolved over time work is Lynn Alden. Obviously, if you haven't read her book, Broken Money, I would encourage you to do that. It's 500 pages long, but it's a simplified breakdown of how money has evolved and how the roles of governments and central banks have changed over time as money has evolved. In her latest interview with Peter McCormick on what Bitcoin did, she talks about how the Fed is blamed for a lot of the problems that we have in today's society. But in a world where they're so commingled with the government, are they able to actually operate independently? Or is someone like Jerome Powell just dealing with a mess that was created long before he came into the chair? Uh, I want to talk to you a bit about central banks because there have been kind of growing, almost like a growing legitimacy behind the idea of not having a central bank, not having the Fed. Whereas before it's, it felt like a, like a radical kind of fringe idea yeah it's not just ron paul it's not just the libertarian party i think wasn't there even i think one senator didn't a senator put in a bill recently suggesting into the fed yeah it's one of those things that won't pass but it's a signaling mechanism and it just kind of shows more more people are kind of fed up for lack of a better word rightly fed up i think so but i think you know there are a lot of things that are blamed on the fed that are not necessarily directly the fed's fault um the way i've been phrasing it lately is because of fiscal dominance central banks kind of find themselves more restricted than normal. It's hard to be truly independent when, when you know, debts and deficits on the public sector are so big. Um, but I think it's one of those things where you can see why they wanted a central bank. Um, but I think it's it's kind of unique to a specific time period of technology. So and one of the things emphasized in the book, Broken Money, is kind of pre-telegraph, everything was analog. Everything moved at the speed of analog. And so even though we had banking, um, we didn't really have fast banking. We, you could only move around ledgers as quickly as you can physically go someplace. But ever since we invented the, the telegraph and then you know telephone and all this kind of range of technologies, now money's going around super fast, but we still couldn't do settlement quickly. 
So we, we, we kind of had to have someone abstract a lot of that for us. And it was kind of prone toward centralization. Uh, I think that's really kind of why the same model took hold everywhere. Um, and But I think that as we leave that era, as we actually now have ways to do fast settlement, you know, basically payments and settlements that can't be reversed, it starts to kind of show that maybe you actually don't even need a central bank. It's becoming clear that their role in maintaining their two mandates, which is price stability and jobs, is becoming a little bit more muddy and murky. Now, they primarily exist to manipulate the cost of money for the federal government in future payments. They simply are just a massive buyer of government debts, which continue to spiral out of control. The CBO, or the Congressional Budget Office for the United States government, projects that the amount of treasuries that the Fed will hold is expected to double from $4.4 trillion to $9.2 trillion by 2034. But there are estimates that that number is undershot and will significantly outpace that. Now, that's not to say that central banks are not without blame. They have, in cases like 2020 to where we are now, manipulated interest rates so much that the wealth distribution for the rich and the 1% or the wealthiest people have created situations where the 1% now own more wealth than the entire middle class. And the question that this poses, which Peter McCormick asked later in the interview, is how in the heck do we get out of this? What's the solution here? There's really only two paths, redistribution or monetary revolution. Uh, holding Bitcoin has proven to be a good strategy over the recent inflationary period and probably will continue to do so. But it does feel like the this this period of high inflation is going to have few few winners and a lot of losers. It's a real squeeze on society, uh, the middle class uh, and and the lower class especially. How does that correct over the t over time, or is the trajectory of this always we're going to always have a widening wealth gap until we have revolution? So partially it depends on, there's kind of two ways to do it. One is revolution. Yep. And then one is kind of a more controlled one where you kind of do it more intentionally. So back in the 40s, for example, there was this wave of communism happening. And the U.S. basically did a thing where, okay, we're going to get a little bit communist for a period of time. And we're going to do some redistribution, but not as much as most other countries did. There was this big, and it was kind of all tied up in the war as well. So when GIs came home, it's like, okay, we'll fund their education, we'll fund their technical training, we'll uh, subsidize their mortgages so they can get a house, um, interstate highway system, things that were fairly popular at the time. Um, and if you do that productively, that's one way to do it. They actually did narrow the wealth gap for, for decades. Where, where did they take the, that money from? Basically from bondholders. So anyone, anyone holding bonds or currency got screwed. They also did extremely high tax rates. Um, and But people still kind of felt in it together, in a sense. And so that's kind of like the, it's almost like the MMT's dream of how they want it to work out, which is, okay, we, we kind of diffuse the money from one place to another and it all kind of works out and we kind of emerge stronger from it. But the problem is there's, for every one of those stories, there's 10 stories where it goes completely off the rails and you mm. get more of an Argentina or or any any number of other things where you, you, you start distributing and then it just kind of keeps spiraling. And people realize if you can do that, why not just keep doing it again and again and again? And it's very hard to do it a little bit. There's camps out there like MMTers who believe that redistribution works over time, but inevitably they create more charts like this. This chart shows that for Nigeria, Turkey, India, Pakistan, Brazil, Bangladesh, Russia, and Mexico, their currencies have experienced a 45% devaluation over just four years. This is the result of excessive money printing. Debt continues to explode. As we talked about a few episodes ago, that worldwide debt has now gone above $315 trillion. The United States has over $35 trillion in debt alone and is expected to be between 50 and 70 trillion by 2034. Debt isn't bad in every situation, especially when it's used to create different things that benefit everybody. For example, debt that the United States government created in the early to mid 1900s to develop the infrastructure that we have now for our utilities, for our water systems, for our roads and highways was an incredibly productive use of debt, which has created lots of flourishing, our industrial system that we have today and the transportation that allows us to have commerce flow easily from different places throughout the country. But for example, when you create $42 billion plan for rural high-speed internet, 
which after three years, not a single Homer person has been able to connect to it, you have to ask, was this money printing or this debt productive? The governmental industrial complex is too large, regardless of candidate, regardless of party. The problems exist. Earlier in the episode, I mentioned that you can have redistribution, which Lynn already talked about, explained, doesn't typically work the majority of the time. Or you can have a monetary revolution, which is Bitcoin. The only way to have a revolution peacefully. Bitcoin is the only viable solution today to separate money from the state, which has grown too big and has grown without rules or accountability. It provides equal opportunity for any and everyone who's able to save their excess productivity into this solution. You can opt out and join the peaceful monetary revolution by downloading the Swan mobile app, where the next $10,000 in Bitcoin purchases will be without fees. And lastly, on a slow day like today, if this episode wasn't enough, I would encourage you to continue to try to educate yourself. One way that you can do that is by checking out our latest Swan Signal Live by Senior Research Analyst at Swan, Sam Callahan, and Ben, BTC Sessions, literally the two greatest educators in our space. They did a live conversation talking about Bitcoin education globally. You don't want to miss it. If you're interested, the link is in the show notes. And with that, we're signing off for today. This is DanteCookLeSwan.com. Happy stacking.